Holly Clark, and we're here to talk about EduSlam ideas for crowdsourcing your professional development. I'm Holly from San Diego, and I would like my other panelists to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm David Hi. Terrio. <laughs> David. I'm David Terrio from uh, Costa Mesa. I teach at Found Valley High School, and uh, I also blog at TheWritingThisIsAll.com. I teach high school English, and I'm really excited to be here. I've seen Holly and uh, Tanya. Some people would maybe say too often, but it, for me, it's never enough. <laughs> Hi, Jenny. everyone. My name is Jenny McGarra, and I am the Digital Learning Coordinator for a network of 29 Chicago public schools called the Academy for Urban School Leadership. Um, I'm also a big Tanya and Holly fan, and uh, it's and also a David fan. So this is this is fun to be on. Thanks, guys. And I'm Tanya Abrith, and I. Um co-host with Holly the EduSlam.me show. Uh, I'm, a, I, I'm a lead teacher for a school board in Montreal for educational technology and digital citizenship. Um, and really excited to be here. Let's, let's get going. So Tanya, can you start by telling us um, what's an EduSlam and why we, were, we decided to use crowdsourcing? So an EduSlam came to came, we came up with the idea for EduSlam um, uh, around January of last year, and the idea came from us sort of being, uh, you know, listening to all of the things that were going on with our networks on Twitter and on Google Plus, and you know, meeting people in conferences, and then getting these really great ideas from them. And we said, wouldn't it be a great idea if we could share those ideas, but really like quickly, because I don't have much time. I don't know about you guys, but I want to know like a good idea, I want to be able to use it, something I can use tomorrow in my classroom or share with my teachers in a short video and give them some ideas. Um, so that's sort of where EduSlam came from and the, the idea of a slam is something that like me, you know, if you've gone to most conferences have slam sessions and we kind of said imagine we could like bottle those slam sessions and some hangouts and just, you know share them with the world so that's essentially where, where the idea came from. Um, in terms of uh, why, well, I mean, our network is the best network you could ever imagine, right? Right, guys? Yes, <laughs> yeah. yes, yes. <laughs> so we had, you know, we, we knew we had the people. We just had to get a way of, of bottling in in one place that people knew they could go and visit, and then using social media was the easiest way to get it out. So that's essentially where, where it all came from. And back when I started teaching, I could have never imagined knowing David or Jenny because there were there was no Twitter, there was no video conferencing, and and as I met all three of you, um, I'm able to keep this friendship going because of Twitter and video conferencing, something that wasn't available to me when I first started teaching. So this is really exciting. Um, so I'll put, I'll put it out there. I have a question for you guys. Um, why do you find the, like, how do you guys use crowdsourcing for your professional learning? Jen, you want to get started? Yeah, so there's a lot of different ways that we do it, both virtually and in person. So um, one example is um, recently we, we started a, a new conference called Playdate, which is People Learning and Asking Why, Digital Age Teacher Exploration, which is also the world's longest acronym. Um, but the idea was hands-on learning, um, even more than an ed conference. The entire thing was workshop style with no leader. And because there was no leader in the in each of these learning spaces, we needed to have some sort of direction. So we didn't want to just throw 20 people into a room and say, "Here's Final Cut Pro. Good luck. See you in an hour," and shut the door. Um, which is actually what we did. We wanted them to have some sort of guiding <laughs> resource to go with. But we didn't want to say, "All right, David's an expert on Final Cut Pro. Throw him in there for two reasons. One, a lot of times." Um, uh, with the exception of the most skilled leaders, it turns into sit and get. And two, David doesn't get to learn. Um, and I think many people experience that. They go to conferences and they spend the entire time sharing and teaching and they don't get to be a learner. So instead what we did was we start, we created Google Doc templates for all of these tools that people voted that they wanted to learn and then sent them out over Twitter, Google+, Facebook, and said, 
hey, everybody, take two minutes, throw in one link, one tip about this resource. If you were going to just say one tweet about how to use it or one tip, do it. And then people filled it out, and then when we threw them into that room for an hour and said, go it to Final Cut Pro, they all jumped on that Google Doc and used it as a guide. So it was like the virtual teacher in the room, and that those people who knew about Final Cut Pro were, were not going to that session. They were going to a session that they actually didn't know about so that they could learn. And that was really powerful because not only did we allow the, the experts on certain tools to go where they were novices and learn new things, but we were able to have folks from all over the world who were experts on that uh, providing the expertise for this event, um, even though they couldn't be there in person. Um, and it really took them, you know, just a handful of minutes to do. So we, and actually, I, I bring that up. I wasn't going to talk about it, but right before I jumped on this this hangout, I got a tweet from someone who did a play date in LA, and um, I, they showed me a page where they were still using all those docs from a year ago. So that was really exciting. Yeah. Wow, that's pretty cool. Dave? Yeah. David? Yeah, so. Um... I started crowdsourcing uh, kind of my memories of events uh, with different people. So um, it actually it, it started as a crowdsourced Twitter chat. Uh, what I always wanted was I wanted some way to be able to collect images from all of my students and kind of keep them all in one place and, uh, and, and be able to do it from where they are. So all my kids have phones and they all use Instagram and stuff like that. So I, I kind of learned about if this then that. And then the first time I actually tested it out was at the Google Teacher Academy. And um, what I can do real quick here is share it with you on, uh, on our screen share real, real quick here. Boom. Full screen. And hopefully you guys are. Are you guys here? Yep. Can you see the screen yet? Not yet. Oh. Now we can. Oh, almost. We were so close. <laughs> I know. Sorry. Okay, here we go. Are we there? Yeah. Okay, great. Sorry, thank you. And uh, so anyway, um, so you can see just right here, what happens is every single time somebody hashtag GTA CHI, then their picture just went up onto, um, onto a WordPress site. And I didn't take all these pictures, and I didn't have to set up a Google Drive or do all these other things. Just all people had to do was hashtag Jitachi, and their pictures would show up, and there's a whole bunch of other pictures on here. You can see it's just scrolling, and it's different people, and it's all their memories. So then I actually have had my students doing this, but what's even cooler is I've had my staff doing this. So at our school, we use hashtag Barons Learn, and we have a WASC accreditation team showing up. So I'm going to be able to show them this website. And every time our teachers something interesting goes on, like Mr. Zebarth wearing a dress in class, uh, <laughs> you can see what's going on, how the kids are learning in classes, what the teachers are doing, et cetera. And it's all through our this hashtag using if this, then that, and WordPress blogs. And it's just crowdsourcing other people, what they're, what they're getting, and just all putting it together. And it's pretty cool. And then one more way that I use Twitter was one time I got on, and I, I think one of the problems that, that we have when we're hiring people is we use the same interview questions all the time. And it was kind of driving me crazy. So I just tweeted out, hey, what are some great interview questions? And I kept tweeting it out, and I got a lot of really interesting stuff, and I put it up on my blog. And what's awesome is like I've done some of the writing in my blog. This was the easiest blog post to ever write because all I did was um, – I just embedded all the tweets. And so you can see there's tweets from all sorts of different people here, like Bill Selleck, who said, describe your personal learning network. That would be a great interview question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Dara Bonham said, how do you move staff, parents, kids, when they want to stand still, which I thought was really awesome. Who was the last person in your school you apologized to, and why did you do it? Um, wow. Shelly oh, Burgess, you. you've just walked out of a classroom and said, wow, that was an amazing learning experience. What did you see? So, and all this was just crowdsourced off of Twitter, and it was sent okay. to me and shared, and it was pretty awesome. So, I'm going to go ahead and come back to the uh, Hangout here and unshare screen, and here we are. Thanks. That's, that's, re that's really great. Holly, I'm, I'm just kind of wondering, would you be able to sort of define crowdsource, um, like what, what, what that means, to, like what do you think that means? Well, I can certainly try. Um, I don't have like an official definition in front of me, but when I think of crowdsourcing, I think of going to your network and using them as a crowd of experts, so to speak, to get um, information, to find out things the way that David did here. 
When he first talked about um, asking interview questions, the first person who came into my mind was Greg Miller. He lives in Canada, and I noticed that he answered. So, so it was an effective crowdsourcing technique because he really he's delved into that a lot. And now he's assistant superintendent, so this is a big part of his job. Um, so it's going to your network. And David Weinberger, I believe, is the last name. He talks about uh, uh, too big to know. The smartest person in the room is the room. And that's really what crowdsourcing is. It's the, the crowd having the knowledge, and the knowledge not being linear and isolated in a book somewhere. It's rather me talking to all of you and learning. And that's why EduSlam, I can't stop talking about it. In fact, people want to like shoot me, I'm sure, when I walk into a presentation, because I'm always like, oh, David does a great EduSlam about that. And then if you see Jenny's and then Carolyn Skiba in Chicago, and, and people think I'm trying to self-promote, but I'm not. I'm learning so much by crowdsourcing that I can't stop talking about it. And um, I get made fun of by a few people like, oh, there you go again. But it's the learning. And, um, you know, Jenny was giving her uh, keynote, and we were both together in South Korea uh, last weekend, and almost everything she was talking about, I knew because Jenny had talked about it on our Edgy Slam. <laughs> so it was just really powerful. You, you know, um, go ahead and talk. No, no, go ahead. No, what I was going to say is um, it, earlier I talked about um, kind of off screen before we even got on here that crowdsourcing is just making things um, kind of easy for smart people. You know, you kind of feel lazy like you're not doing the work for other people. But there is a little bit of work involved in that the, your crowdsourcing will be better as you get to know more people. So if the smartest person in the room is the room, but your room is really big, then mm -hmm. your crowdsourcing is going to be better. So if you're not involved on Twitter, if you're not involved in Google Plus communities, it's going to be more difficult to do crowdsourcing. So you have to get out there and you know just get involved in the conversation. And then your room will grow, and you'll see that crowdsourcing gets really impressive. The reason that EduSlam works is that Holly and Tanya have put in a ton of time and effort in getting to know a lot of really amazing people and me um, and, <laughs> and, and, and so their room is huge, and that and they've learned that also they value people's time because we don't like to waste people's time. And everybody tells me that Edu Slams work because they're short, and they value people's time, and they're not going to have somebody wade through one hour of video to find five minutes worth of topics. And so mm -hmm. they've done the hard work of editing, getting people focused, finding the right people, and giving content that people cares about. And so their room. Yeah, it looks like the Coliseum. Oh, I want to add too that I think a lot of people hear words like crowdsource and Twitter, and they're turned off. Our, our friends who might be a little bit more technophobic, and I just want to point out that teachers are natural crowdsourcers. And so what happens all the time is you have a grade level meeting in your grade level partner's room, and you guys are talking about a student or debriefing a report card pickup or whatever, and you notice an awesome anchor chart or really cool writer's workshop folder that they have built in. You're like, hey, could I see that? How did you do that? Can you show me? That's crowdsourcing, mm -hmm. even though there's only two people in your room. And what technology allows you to do is be in more teachers' rooms and get in more people's heads and take those ideas um, and apply them to your own practice. So it's amplifying your reach and connection with other people. So if folks are afraid of the word crowdsourcing or think, I'm, I, don't, I can't do that, that's too hard, just remember, anytime you get an idea from a friend or a colleague or a grade level partner, that's crowdsourcing. This is just amplifying that. And and speaking about like amplifying it, when we when we apply that to our students, um, and we teach them those skills, because I think that that's an essential skill for our students that are growing up today to be able to learn how to use their networks um, and use technology in a way that they can help improve their own learning. So I know that Jenny, that you have some really interesting things that you do with your students with in, in, in that sense. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, we do a couple things, and I don't think it's a novel idea anymore, but the idea of the student leadership team in a school, that the kids are uh, driving the boat of, around technology and 
they're the ones with the agency. So we have them, the first step is to give them the power. So to have them, they vet the apps before we use them, they write app reviews, they publish, they, their voice is really heard. Uh, t um, Holly just said we were in Korea and at Seoul Foreign School, their group is called Tech Crew Satyrs, which is pretty awesome and they do some great work and they were leading sessions. Um, I, I was in Auburn, Maine, same thing, they have a tech crew. Um, so we give them that self-efficacy, that agency to have a voice and to kind of crowdsource their knowledge. They here is this app, we think it's great, what do you think, or we don't think it's great, and we've had app developers reply and, and actually um, actively seek their feedback. But then they take that expertise and they share it with other folks and uh, allow them to crowdsource from the students by doing uh, things like app speed dating or app speed sharing where um, they have small uh, groups where teachers go through each station and do a quick learn from an app and move to the next one. So they're like almost like mini Ignite sessions with the kids to learn the apps uh, in a high speed, high energy basis. But again, all of that, like I think crowdsourcing for kids is kind of twofold. It's not only about getting the great ideas but sharing it and the kids becoming a source for the crowd to learn from. So it's creating more power and agency for our kids, which for many of our students they don't have enough of. So um, again, it's them learning from others, but also having uh, the pulpit to to be the the resource for for teachers and for their peers. Yeah. And understanding how to vet that too, to to decide who is a source that you want to bring into your room. Because we have a lot of people on Twitter that we're friends with, but we've really handpicked the people on EduSlam so far. There's a lot of people we don't know about either, and we're hoping to meet them at ISTE and Q. And um, but right now it's understanding who really are the experts. Um, David, you were going to say something? No, I was just going to talk, uh, just to piggyback on what Jen said, we did the same thing with us. We did a snap learning with a kind of speed dating thing, and our most popular session by far was the student, well, we had several student-led sessions, but was one on cheating, and uh, they're, wow. they're now being asked to speak at the district level on the same subject. Um, you know, we have 150 teachers here, but we have almost 4,000 students, and so to look to your students as a, um, a place where you can learn from. Yeah, absolutely. Turn to the students. Well, that's what's coming next on EduSlam, so that's a great segue, because we are going to devote a whole, maybe even month, to student voice. We want to know what students are thinking, what they want in education, what, what are great lessons to them, and um, start listening to, to their ideas. Um, I just want to share very quickly before we, we wrap up, um, just uh, just so I can show the viewers what EduSlam looks like and where they can find it. Um, so um, you can find EduSlam. It's at eduslam.me, and .me is actually the um, part of the URL. A lot of people don't understand that, but we didn't want it to be eduslam.com. We wanted it to be a play on words as well as thinking outside of the box. Everything doesn't have to be .com anymore. It's 2013, almost 2014. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, this is one of our favorites. <laughs> um, and we have uh, two or three pages now of eduslams um, of, of teachers who are doing great innovative, game-changing work in their classroom. Um, and so we hope you'll visit eduslam.me. We hope you'll also go to the blogs of our two co-presenters here. And we, um, we wanted to bring in Jenny and David because that's crowdsourcing. We know that they're experts, so we went into the field and asked, will you help us with this? Because they have a lot to offer as well. So thank you both David and Jenny for coming in and helping us with this presentation today. Thanks for inviting us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. In any room we're in, we want you in. So. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Okay, thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah, no problem. Thank you.